15, which of the following best describes the conditions expected after 24 hours? A. 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 The bag will contain more water than it did in the original condition. Water goes into the bag because it has high percent starch, and outside the bag is completely water, so water is going to move in. Yeah. So if the bag is, would that mean the bag is hypotonic? The bag would be. Hypotonic. Yeah. And the solution outside would be hypertonic. Okay. What's 116? Instead of uh, a potato slice was put in there, what would what would happen there? It would, it would gain, gain mass. mass, right? I thought it would gain. It because would it's, gain it's soaking water. up water. It gain mass. Uh, water would oh. yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. What? No tricky questions. I got one. Call in the mood for that. I'm not, yeah, I'm not in the mood for any of them. One of these days, I shall be in pentathlete. Ten of them. Just be freaking be quiet. A pentathlete would be five. Alright. That guy. That guy. This is the last day of study before the test. We're just going to talk about fungi today, which is chapter 22. The test is going to be that's going to be Friday next week. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we have another lab. It's a computer lab. Yes. Question. Um, I noticed that 21.2 is really, really, really long. Yeah. Uh, what certain parts of that, I mean, do we, do we need to read all of that, or are there parts that aren't really necessary? Yeah, it's like most of it's not really necessary. Okay, could you tell me, like, what, what would be important? How to approach. Basically, what you want to understand is what a protist is. So I think 21.1. Characteristics so the characteristics of protists is important. Do we, do we need to know protist diversity? That's the first page, page 384. Do we need to know the diversity of something? Probably not. So just I, I think it's also important that you know about red tides and algae blooms, which, it uh, which are caused by dinoflagellates when there's too much uh, when there's too much um, nutrients in the water and they multiply out of control. So that's page 392. Algae blooms. Yeah, talking about red tides and algae blooms. So just characteristics and then red tides. I think, I think all the stuff on malaria could be important. Page 394. And I guess I'll tell you what, while we're on this, 
show you a little something that they have here. Could you uh, get the lights for me over there, Hannah? This is probably good for you to know. I'm going to go to this AP Central website. Have you ever heard of that? I'm going to go to the biology homepage. And I'm going to go to a part of it. I don't know how well you can read. But it says biology textbook correlation. So it says, under where it says AP Biology Course Planning and Pacing Guide, and I go down here to Biology Textbook Correlations, click on that. It's got all the different textbooks that are used around the country to teach this class. I would make. We're Mater for the bottom middle one. So um, if this were the Brady Bunch, we would be the mother. <laughs> It shows every chapter and what is required to know. Pretty much until now, all of every chapter was required. But now there's st some stuff that's thrown out. And what's thrown out or what's important. Okay, so here's chapter 21, you see, 21.1. Biology of protists. Well, they're saying that page is thrown out. But here are the important pages here to know under 21.2. 391 to 392. See, they're talking about algal blooms is important. Potato blight is important. <coughs> so on page 391, they talk about potato blight. Across the Irish pan, right? That's right. Potato blight? Potato blight on page 391. So let's see if that's correct. If that's, is that the right page? <coughs> Look on 391 and see if you see potato blight in there anywhere. Yeah. Great. Nothing in there about potato blight, huh? Yes, of course. Yeah, it is. 391 on the right. Yeah. The water mold Phytophthora infestans was responsible for the 1840s potato famine in Ireland. Right. Talking about water molds there. Oh, so that's useful. Then. We could use that. Yeah, this is kind of a useful page. This is what's covered. They've gone through this and shown you what what's possible to be covered on the AP exam and what's, what's probably not going to be covered on, on these pages. We don't need to know the but you need to know what a protist is. I'm not sure why they put this on the right, but uh, I, I, think, I, think that's, I think you need to know what a protist is. Like, for instance, you'll see probably the way they'll ask this to you is they'll have, it'll be some kind of evolution type question. And it'll say, um, you know, uh, where would you place this? Uh, they found this ancient protist, and, and where would you place it on your evolutionary tree or something like that? You need to know what a protist is to be able to answer that question. So, uh, and I think page 384 tells you what a protist is. Um, you shouldn't go through this class without knowing what a protist is. So. The simplest but most diverse uh, What's a, what, I mean, uh, do, you, do you have any tissues? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Is it you see a tissue box? Maybe uh, I don't. Uh, great. All right, you can go outside to the bathroom. Okay. You can see. Uh, look down here. Look at this chapter, chapter 23. Almost all of it is. You don't have to know. And if we continue, and I'm just going to skim some of these chapters. Look at 27, 28, 29. All this stuff in the right column. They're not really saying it's important for you to know. And, and 
you don't really need to refer to this that much. I'll, I'll, I'll try and cover, I'll, I'll look at it, I'll try and cover it in class and tell you in class, but this is where I'm getting my stuff to teach from. If you ever miss some classes or something like that, or you're wondering what, what you should know from the chapter. So do include 384 for my test, because I do want you to know what the purpose is. So now we're going to talk about fungi. So turn to page 404. Spores, which cause the mold to appear black. The growth of molds on food helps break down organic matter in a process of decomposition and natural recycling. How long did they have to record that? Because it's easier for them to grow. What's the what's the most basic reason why why heat speeds things up? More energy. Do it, Savannah. Molecules move faster when it's warmer, so you're going to get faster growth, faster everything. Uh, if you want to slow down the molding of an orange, you know what you do? Freeze it. You freeze it, it make it colder. So anyway. Um, what, what a fungus is, is a kind of a mat of, of filaments. Each, each one of these things is, is known as a fungal filament or a fungal thread. And it has a scientific name, it's called a hypha. A hypha is a single fungus thread. And many fungal threads you would call hyphae. And then if the fungal threads grow so great that there's a visible mat of them, like you see on that corn tortilla, that's called a mycelium. A mycelium is a big... 
big mat of hyphae, many hundreds or thousands of hyphae <coughs> that are growing. And they all, they'll all grow from a single spore. <coughs> Fungi reproduce with spores. They're microscopic cells that float around in the air. And they'll land somewhere and grow into a fungus. Isn't it spores? Spores. Microscopic cells that float through the air. <laughs> and they'll land somewhere and grow into a fungus. That's fun to play with. You can see, you see that dark blotch kind of expanding underneath? This looks like something's growing underneath the uh, peel. Can y'all see that? Or is it, yeah. you have better eyes than you? Doubt that very seriously. Well, that's what happens is a spore lands and the little fungal threads grow kind of down in the the orange there, where it's more where it's moist. And then when the fungus wants to reproduce, it shoots a thread <coughs> upward that has a little stalk on the top. And spores will be created in the stalk. And then the stalk will break open and release the spores. And so that's what you're seeing here when this breaks out of the all this white stuff, those are little stalks with little caps on them that break open and release spores. So see the fungus that's underneath is reproducing with this these white with this white fuzzy stuff here. And it eventually becomes brown, dark, when the when the cat the cap ripens. It goes from light colored to dark colored and then bursts open and releases the spores. And so these spores will break open from the, right now, they're bursting open and floating around the room, and they'll float, and if there happens to be another worm somewhere, they'll, well, a spore will land on it and start growing there, you see. They're, these microscopic spores are floating around this room right now. So from somebody's spoiled right orange, could be <laughs> in Waycross, floated all the way over there. <coughs> you know, the winds kind of blow there, so we get all the way across the spores. What were you going to ask me, Jessica? Were you asking? Let's say if you put like a ripe orange right next to it, it might start to. Yeah, uh huh. Sure. Bread molds the same way. What happens if you eat it? Well, mo use, most fungi are poisonous, they'll produce poisons. So if you eat something that's got a lot of mold on it or a lot of fun fungus on it, you, you got. You can get sick. Cheese is an yeah. exception though, right? There are you get green mold on cheese. There are types. There are types of mold that don't produce like poison. Like mold on top of mold. I don't know. I'm not much of a cheese guy. Yeah, like some mushrooms. I like grilled cheese. Yeah. I don't eat cheese. I like cheese. Like some mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Like some mushrooms. Like when yeah. my grandfather gave the wrong type of mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> Something like 96% of mushrooms are poisonous. So. Huh. Look at this is a uh, this is a fungal thread, a hypha under the microscope, and there is a spore being born from it. That's a spore. Yeah. This this one doesn't have a uh, uh, this doesn't show any uh, you said thread and capsule. This one I guess just bud spores right off of it. Can I mark these do that? You said 96% of mushrooms are poisonous? Yeah, something like that. <coughs> now some of the hypha look like this, okay. looking up close, and some of them look like this. We call this a septate hypha, because there are divisions between the cells. <coughs> Compared to the other kingdoms of living things, the basic structure of fungi is rather peculiar. The fungal body consists mainly of threads called hyphae that search out and digest food, and that can give rise to special organs used for spore production called fruiting bodies, like the microscopic example pictured here. Hyphae grow very rapidly from a single spore, and as they branch out, a tangled mass called a mycelium is formed. Mycelia can be enormous in size, larger than a thousand soccer fields, and have been observed <coughs> to grow as much as a kilometer or six-tenths of a mile each day searching for food. 
The mushrooms we find growing in woods and lawns are actually complex spore-making structures that arise from a large underground mycelium. In fact, looking at the stalk of this mushroom, we can see that it is composed of thousands of threads of hyphae very tightly packed together. In some fungi, hyphae threads are divided up into individual cells, like porous cell walls that allow mitochondria, ribosomes, and even nuclei to pass from cell to cell. But in other fungi hyphae form, cytocytic threads, that is, threads that are not divided up into individual cells and are often filled with hundreds of nuclei. The largest organism in the world, they think, or that they know of, is a fungus that's growing in Oregon and Washington State. It grows underground, you see, in the woods, and it spreads and spreads, and they know because they've taken DNA samples from over here, and then they drive 40 miles that way, and DNA samples from here, and it's the same individual, the same fungus. It's growing under the ground and it's, it's like hundreds of square miles in size. Way bigger than anything else on Earth. Is that bad? Is it bad? No. Is it what? Is it bad for the Earth? No. It takes, the fungus, yeah, I'll show you the pictures. The fungus uh, decompose things, so when leaves drop from the trees, the fungus will eat it up, good. you see? So yeah, so it's good. It returns the, the nutrients to the soils and such. But uh, it's interesting that the largest organism is a fungus. You wouldn't think about that. The, the mushrooms that you see sprouting up are the reproductive structures. That's just how it reproduces. And I'll show you the reproductive uh, cycle of a, of a mushroom next. What in the world? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Dead tree trunks are not wasted. And neither are dead leaves when they fall. Both are food for fungi. Some leaves are captured even before they reach the ground. The fungus has constructed a net stretched between the twigs of the undergrowth. Once they've caught their leaf, the threads put out white ferns. dissolves the cellulose in the leaves. Why doesn't it dissolve the fungus too? Because fungi are not plants. Their bodies don't contain cellulose. They're constructed instead from a material much more akin to that of which animal horn and hooves are made. Fungi are neither plant nor animal. They belong to a category of life that is all their own. Nourished by the liquefied tissues of leaves, this fungus puts out more threads. But fungi do require moisture. They can only live out in the open like this in the moist atmosphere of the rainforest. In cooler, drier woodlands, they have great difficulty in living out in the open. Instead, they hide in the ground or within the tissues of the bodies they feast on. A fungus has no stem, no root, no leaves. For most of the time, it's nothing more than a tangled tissue of branching threads. These produce digestive acids, absorb the resulting soup, and then use it to construct more threads and widen their search for more dead plant tissue. But cellulose is very low in nitrogen. To get that, some fungi trap living animals. The microscopic threads develop tiny lassoes. These give off a chemical that attracts microscopic worms, nematodes. One of them nuzzles into the ring. <coughs> and the fungus suddenly draws its lasso tight. are 
killed, and the fungus has its nitrogen. Pretty cool. All this takes place out of sight, below ground, or within the body of a dead plant. Only when a fungus is ready to reproduce does it make itself more visible. so small that they drift away like smoke. But the appearance of these spectacular constructions is brief. As soon as their spores have been shed, sometimes after only a few days, they collapse. Now they are merely food for maggots. So the corpses of plants do not retain their nutriment forever. Some of it is consumed by fungi, and the remainder, now in a soluble form, seeps back into the soil to sustain the next generation. carbon dioxide and it fills the bread up so that the bread rises. The bread won't rise unless you put living yeast in there. When you heat the bread up hot enough, the yeast will die. There's a little cup fungus. There's all types of fungi out there. These are called truffles, which are type of fungus. So this is a called a smut. There are some fungi that are parasitic. That means they grow on living organisms. And so this leaf is being attacked by fungi. See all that's fungus. And they can actually put their little hyphae into living organisms and kill them. And here it shows <coughs> up close. These are the cells of the leaf. And this is the fungi kind of growing in between the cells of the leaf. And the fungi will suck the nutrients out of each leaf cell. Here's some of the, some more reproductive structures. <coughs> this is an athlete's foot fungus. You ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. On some guy's toe there. And this is a ringworm. It's a fungus also. Ringworm is not a worm, it's a fungus. A spore lands on your neck there and then grows <coughs> its hyphae 
and grows outward from where the spore landed, you say. And uh, you got to use some fungicide to kill the fungus. So is it very contagious? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Is it? Yeah. Probably wouldn't want to hug this person, lay your neck on top of their ring. Yeah, and if it's uh, in your so. hairline, it'll like lose your hair where it is. Gross. Yeah. There's a big old did any of y'all ever watch the Smurfs? Yeah. Mm, they live in that kind of mushroom, right? They live under those. They aren't real, but... What? This is cool. This is a fungus called ergot. And uh, it talks about some deadly fungi on page 411. This, is a, this, by the way, is one of the most poisonous types of fungi. They don't tell you that in the Smurf um, <laughs> cartoon. But um, this ergot... Uh, this is a fungus that makes a chemical y'all are probably interested in on the weekends, LSD. You ever heard of that? No. Uh, no. <laughs> Back in the 60s, they did a lot of LSD. Um, this, uh, this fungus will infect grains like wheat, and it'll grow on the grains, and uh, people who know how to grow it will make LSD, and, you know, it's an it's a acid that causes hallucinations if you ingest it. Interesting, they think that the, uh, the whole uh, Salem witch craze was caused by infected, by grain that was naturally infected with this ergot. And that people would eat the, the, the grain and they'd have hallucinations and then everybody thought they were a witch because they were running around saying they were seeing things and then they'd burn them at the stake. And uh, only recently have they figured out that that's probably what happened? Isn't that cool? Because they had some of that grain left over, and they and they did, you know, that was it was kind of fossilized, and they did research on it, and they found that ergot in there. And yeah. So that's probably what happened. The scientists who discovered LSD had a good time with it. It's true. Is it? Yeah. yeah. I know he, was doing, he was just playing with it. Oh, know, really? He, Ingested some. Yeah. Something. It went yeah. great. Now, so I want to talk a little bit about how these things reproduce. And, and biology, these, this AP test is interested in the cellular, uh, cellular structures and discussing cellular things. And so uh, an interesting, this is the life cycle of a fungus called a club fungi that produces mushrooms. And um, I want to go through it with you here. And, and this is something different than you've ever, than you're experienced with. 
All of our chromos all of our cells in our body have two sets of chromosomes. Except for our sex cells. Our sex cells only have one set. Our sex cells are haploid because they were formed by meiosis, right? So fungi spores are haploid. And out of the spores will grow hyphae that are also haploid. So do they go through meiosis as well? As well? I'm going to show you that. It's exciting, isn't it? So here's a spore, and this is a plus type spore. And when I say plus type, I, I, I can't, it's, it's, the, it's what we call their mating types. Fungi have plus mating types and minus mating types, you see. It's kind of like male and female. So the plus mating type hyphae here and a minus mating type hyphae here are growing near each other. And they're both haploid. But what they're going to do is they're going to come together and grow together. You see how that worked? They're growing separately right now, but they, they get attracted to one another somehow, and they grow together. Oh. And now you have cells that have two sets of chromosomes. Does that always happen? Um, it, it happens if two opposite mating types are near each other. If they're not, it'll just keep growing alone. And then, and then spread out. But it'll only produce mushrooms when it comes together with an opposite mating type. So this is fungus sex. Are y'all watching here? This is how fungi do it. The hyphae are growing together, and bam, they're together. Yay. Now we have a cell that has two separate nucleus, nuclei. We call a kind of cell that has two separate nuclei, we call it dikaryotic. That isn't quite like our cells. Our cells don't have two separate nuclei. Our cells have a single nucleus with two sets of chromosomes. A haploid cell has one set of chromosomes. A dikaryotic cell has two separate nuclei, each with a set of chromosomes. But what we're going to see is these dikaryotic cells will end up forming a mushroom, and the nuclei are going to come together in the mushroom. Are you okay here, EKF? You're about to ask a question. Um, I was wondering what the dikaryotic. It's a cell with two two separate, two separate nuclei. nuclei. Okay, so here we go. What happens is this this new mice this new hyphae, which has two sets of nuclei, what it does is starts wrapping around itself and growing into a big ball. It starts growing like crazy, kind of like winding up a, uh, 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 some twine. It grows into a thick growth that's underground. And so let's watch this thick growth underground develop. That's what it's trying to show here. It develops into this ball-like structure. This ball-like structure is dikaryotic. It has, each cell in it has two sets of chromosomes, which is different than what we've ever seen. And this thing's going to sprout a mushroom. There's the mushroom. I don't know. You'll have to talk to a mycologist. That's a, uh, that's a scientist that studies mushrooms. So anyway, here now we're going to look into the gills of the mushroom. And when we look in the gills, we see this basidium that I was talking about earlier, which is like the club-shaped thing. And I want you to notice, now pay attention here. Sarah, this is the big finish. There's a nucleus, and there's a nuclear inside this cell. And those nuclei are going to come together. You see them come together? They come together. Now the cell is not haploid. It's not dikaryotic. You know what we call it? Diploid. It's diploid. We now have a diploid cell, a single nucleus with two sets of chromosomes. Now immediately that nucleus, after it forms, goes through a process that we call meiosis. 
Do you remember what meiosis does to a diploid cell that's 2N? Makes it haploid. Crossing over? Meiosis is the pro yes, crossing over occurs. In the, in the absorbent. But meiosis takes a diploid, a single diploid cell, and makes four haploid cells out of it. So here we go through meiosis. Single diploid cell is going to end up forming four haploid cells. You see there? Did you see that or did you miss it? Some of y'all were looking away. You should look at the board when I'm talking. See, uh, here we have the two nuclei come together, and then meiosis occurs, and we get four haploid <coughs> nuclei, four haploid cells. Those two are minus type, and those two are plus type, and those will be shed, they'll fall off, and they'll land somewhere, and start the whole cycle again. Are they always there? Those are spores. So let's let's watch the whole cycle, see if you can make sense of this. What we call a mushroom is just the above ground sexual structure of the fungus. Above ground, a mushroom typically consists of a stipe that supports a cap. The undersides of some mushroom caps have hundreds of thin sheets of tissue extending out from the stalk. These are gills. Club-shaped basidia line the gill surfaces. When a basidia spore lands in a suitable environment, it germinates to produce hyphae that form a haploid mycelium. The mycelia of basidium mycotes have different mating types. When two different mating types come in contact, the hyphae fuse. A new mycelium forms. Each cell contains one haploid nucleus from each of the two mating strains. New mushrooms develop quickly. Inside each basidium, haploid nuclei come together to form a diploid cell. <coughs> Meiosis then occurs, producing four haploid nuclei that each become a basidiospore. As these basidiospores mature, they break off from the city and are carried by the wind to new locations. Audio is kind of bad there. I think you get it. There's a fairy ring somebody was talking about. See, when these, these two spores came together and landed, and the hyphae stretch out everywhere, so you get a ring of mushrooms as the hyphae grows, that ring will get bigger and bigger. Under the ground there are a couple of a plus strain and a minus strain of fungus growing. They started in the center and grew outward. That's called a fairy ring. Shelf fungus. Poor mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite jokes. There's a puffball. You want to see a puffball? Shoot out some spores. <laughs> hey, there's the biggest mushroom anyone's ever found. Those things just appear and disappear real quickly, but that's the biggest single mushroom. There's smut growing on some corn. It's a parasitic fungus. <coughs> It's called rust, a fungus growing on some leaves. <coughs> and finally, lichens. Lichens are uh, basically a lichen is a symbiosis. It's a fungus and an algae living together. The fungus absorbs water and gives it to the algae, and the algae does photosynthesis and makes food and gives it to the fungus. <coughs> Lichens grow everywhere. They're really good. Where are you going? Three, two.